Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sustainable Buildings Canada uh, webinar on ESG. Um, I see we had a, a lot of interest on this, um, and I, I just had a computer error pop up while I'm <laughs> talking to you here. Um, give me one moment. I'm very sorry about this. Uh, there, go there. My computer. Wow. Um, there we go. Okay, back on track. Sorry for that. Um, so, welcome to our presentation on uh, environmental, social, and government issues. Um, as we know, this is uh, this is sort of a big area um, that's growing really, really quickly within um, corporate governance. Um, and so, we're lucky enough to have uh, Sarah Keys here from ESG Global Advisors, who also happens to be a board member. Um, of Sustainable Buildings Canada. So I'm just going to um, introduce a few things. Um, if you've been on our webinars before, you know we've got a few things coming up soon. Uh, and I always like to review those first. And then we'll hand things over to Sarah and she'll give us an overview of um, ESG specifically for the building sector and real estate. So first things first, coming up very, very soon, um, November 1st, we have our annual Green Building Festival. Um, well, we're pretty excited this year um, to sort of push things uh, conceptually beyond uh, the idea of net zero um, and then reducing environmental impact um, with our theme of positive. So we're um, highlighting projects um, that are pushing toward a positive environmental impact from buildings um, and uh, participants can earn up to five and a half continuing education hours for various uh, organizations, including um, GBCI and uh, OAA and many more. Um, and as you can see there, it's only $100 for a virtual pass, $350 for in-person. Um, we're down at the Eaton Center Marriott, um, as we have been previous to COVID um, for many years. Um, so please um, join us there if you can. And if you would like to join us virtually, there's a code there, SPC webinar uh, for 25% off the virtual pass. Um, I just want to clarify that uh, virtually you will be also able to get those CEUs if you attend um, and you'll get the full day of programming. So we welcome anyway. And I'd just like to quickly show you here's the, the um, lineup. So anyone who's not on our mailing list um, and hasn't had a chance to check out the Green Building Festival um, agenda for this year, here it is before you. Um, so we have uh, quite an international array of speakers on um, this broad topic of positive, uh, but we're also highlighting some um, Canadian approaches, including Evolve One, um, which is a, a real hit in the sustainable building world, um, Canada's um, first um, at zero building. So, sorry, net positive building. Uh, and then also at 1050, uh, Peter Amaranjan um, is a builder from Alberta who is using the energy sprung or energy sprung, if you'd like to use the, the proper German uh, approach, which is sort of a modular industrialized approach to renovations. Um, and Sustainable Buildings Canada um, was a, a key component in getting that brought to Canada. Um, so we're really looking forward to hearing what uh, Peter is doing out there. As always, our website has um, lots of resources um, for new construction and for existing buildings. Um, I just got some notes this morning that, that something seems to be broken. So if you go to this website right now, um, you might not be able to get these reports. Um, so we'll have that fixed as soon as we can. If you have any trouble, feel free to email me or Mike or anyone at SBC or use the contact form on the website and we will get you whatever it is you're looking for as soon as we can. That is all I have to say about uh, promoting SBC. I'd like to introduce you to our, our presenter today, Sarah Keys from ESG Global Advisors. Um, Sarah is an experienced ESG and climate change expert um, with over a decade being a thought leader, consultant, facilitator, and auditor. And she's the, the CEO of ESG Global Advisors and regularly presents to executive teams, boards of directors um, on the link between ESG and climate change with financial and operational performance and long-term value. So Sarah is, as I mentioned, is on the board of uh, Sustainable Buildings Canada and, and has also helped us um, realize these same um, risks um, and, and understand uh, the best strategies for SBC moving forward. So with that, I'd like to hand things over to Sarah. Um, 
And there's Sarah. Now you should have screen sharing control. Perfect. Thank you, Adam. And you can just confirm for me that you can see my screen there. There we are. It's in full screen. Looks great. Perfect. OK, thank you. And thanks to all of you for attending this webinar today. Um, I'm excited, as, as Adam mentioned, I'm excited to be able to uh, offer some of this ESG overview and what it means for the real estate and building sector um, as a proud member of the Board of Directors of Sustainable Buildings Canada. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm a chartered accountant by background, so I started out my career as a financial statement auditor in the mining and extractive sector. Uh, and I've since then worked in a variety of different capacities for a variety of different sectors, including but not limited to real estate and buildings. Um, as the CEO of ESG Global Advisors, as Adam mentioned, uh, I really do help to advise companies and their investors on all things ESG. And what we're really seeing from our firm's perspective is a growth of ESG in the real estate and building sector. Uh, and so we'll talk about some of these macro level trends today and ultimately what do they mean in terms of implications for the sector. So before we get started, I always like to um, align on terminology and I want to acknowledge something really important here. And that is that the acronym of ESG is relatively new, uh, but the notion of sustainability and even uh, corporate social responsibility is not new. And organizations like Sustainable Buildings Canada, as well as many other not-for-profits across the country, have been focused on this notion of sustainable development for many decades. And so what you see here on the slide is really delineating and defining both the overlap and the distinction between these concepts. So corporate social responsibility uh, been in place since the 1980s, really took hold in the 1990s and has a broad range of target audiences that include both internal and external stakeholders to the organization, employees, local communities, customers, and so on. What's reasonably new is the capital markets focus on the subset of CSR issues that could be financially material to an organization. And so you can think of ESG as that subset of CSR issues that could be financially material to a company's value. They tend to represent strategic factors that have not traditionally been considered in the capital markets when allocating um, capital, both debt and equity. And so the stakeholder group for this is actually laser focused on that capital markets. And it includes both equity and debt investors, uh, but also those who work within the financial ecosystem, proxy advisors, rating agencies, financial regulators, as well as credit rating agencies. So we will speak a little bit more about some of these trends and why they're interested in this topic. But a really good shorthand way to think about the distinction between the two is that ESG is focused on value, whereas CSR is focused on values. And the design of this slide is intentional because we really start to see particularly post-pandemic, a huge shift in the green circle overlapping more and more with this blue circle as we've come to recognize that our economy is inextricably linked to the environment and society upon which it depends. Another um, area that I just want to level set on is the notion of the G in ESG. Um, I often get asked, governance is not a new idea, so why is it in this acronym? And I think it's an important question. And so we've designed this slide to help and show uh, that governance is really the foundational element of ESG. It does include some of those traditional things like board quality, independence and accountability, engagement and shareholder rights. But what the G in ESG really means is the oversight of material, environmental and social issues as part of core oversight of strategy, risk management, performance and disclosure to investors and other stakeholders. So what you can see is the newer area in this space is the recognition that environmental and social issues can pose material risks to an organization, and therefore they should be subject to the same level of governance and oversight as any other material traditional business issue as shown on the far right in that darker blue circle. And one last point I'd like to make here is that the material environmental and social issues are really gonna vary by three key elements. The first, of course, is your sector. What's material or relevant to an organization is going to largely be driven by its sector. And I'll talk a little bit about how some of the reporting standards have evolved to meet this need. The second thing it's gonna be differentiated by is your unique uh, operating jurisdictions. So the laws, regulations, policies, and key stakeholders that you're working with will really be driven by where you're physically operating. And this is especially true for real estate and buildings. 
And last but not least is really looking at the entity specific circumstances, thinking about what is the organization's existing strategy, where has it already identified material, environmental and social issues, and ultimately, what do its owners and providers of capital expect from the organization when it comes to ESG? <clears throat> so this next slide really showcases some of the macro level trends we're gonna be talking about today. And the first is the growth in responsible investment. What you've got on the left-hand side is a chart from the UN Principles for Responsible Investment. This is the gold standard initiative that investors, both asset owners and asset managers, so when I say asset owners, I mean the pensions, wealth funds, endowments, and foundations who ultimately own the portfolio of assets and have beneficiaries to which they will pay pensions. And then the second category is asset managers, which is ultimately those um, asset owners outsourcing the management of the funds, the investment of the portfolio to these managers. And in doing so, they then ask them to fulfill certain requirements around responsible investment if they are a signatory to the UN PRI. And the growth in signatories to the UN PRI is significant and important to watch for the real estate and building sector because it is the investor pressure on organizations that has driven so much of the conversation about ESG and the need for strategies and transparent reporting um, in order to access capital in the capital markets. And what we've now seen is that it's mainstream and the pandemic has really accelerated this trend. In Canada, one out of every $2 that's professionally managed applies a responsible investment approach. And in the US, it's one out of every $3. So it's not too far behind. And what we can see is that the majority of those are actually using something called ESG integration. And that means they're considering the material, financial and environmental and social issues altogether when making an investment decision. But they are not excluding certain sectors on the basis of values. So that's a misconception around the notion of ESG integration. There is no exclusion of any sectors, including real estate and buildings. As a result, it means that those seeking capital need to have ESG strategies in place to be able to explain how they're mitigating their most financially material, environmental, and social risks, and importantly, capitalizing on some of the new growth opportunities. And so what you see here is the uh, range of approaches that can use uh, a responsible investment umbrella. So, you know, when we say responsible investment or sustainable investing, there are a number of different strategies that investors use um, within this umbrella term. So ESG integration, as I noted, is really that structured consideration of ESG alongside traditional financial factors to improve their risk and opportunity analysis with the sole goal of seeking enhanced risk adjusted returns. So make no mistake, investors applying an ESG integration approach are not doing this for a values-based reason. They're doing this for a financial value-based reason, meaning they believe that their long-term portfolio returns will be impacted if these issues are not identified and managed. As we move to the far right of this spectrum, this is where we start to see values coming into play. Socially responsible investing, or SRI, is where you begin to see the exclusion of companies in specific industries. This is what many think about when they think about responsible investing or social or sustainable investing. But I would just importantly note that in fact, this is a pretty small portion of the approaches being used in North America. North American uh, institutional investors tend to favor ESG integration. But when we see SRI and then thematic and impact investing, we can start to see the growth in these smaller areas over time. So they're certainly important for companies to pay attention to. And so SRI is really excluding certain sectors, traditionally guns, tobacco, controversial weapons, but increasingly seeing uh, requests, for example, for fossil fuel based, fossil fuel free based funds. And this is on the uh, notion of values. Furthest to the right is the smallest area currently in terms of assets under management, but the fastest growing. And that's thematic or impact investing, where we're actually saying the objective, the primary objective of the investment is to create a measurable, positive social or environmental impact. And usually these are done by themes, things like gender equality or low carbon solutions. 
Uh, and this is really where you're seeing the values leading the investment strategy. So just important to note that an organization saying they use responsible or sustainable investing, it's really important to look under the hood and understand what are the specific strategies and what could those mean for your organization in terms of the real estate and building sector. You know, it's important beyond just the, the capital markets to think about some of the macro level trends that we're seeing with respect to demographics. And, you know, I've chosen here just to highlight um, the wealth transfer that is impending from baby boomers to millennials in the notion of around $75 million over the next few decades. And when you ask millennials what they're thinking about investing in, 88% of those high net worth millennials said they're actively reviewing the ESG impact of their investment holdings. And they're actually expecting their financial advisors to do a deep dive into how a company is performing on ESG before even recommending an opportunity. And they're twice as likely as their baby boomer parts to say they will not invest in something if it has a negative impact on the people or the planet. So again, we're starting to see not only a decision of um, you know, choosing to work where one values, uh, one's values align, but also choosing to put one's retirement funds into companies that also align with their values. So you can see that over time, this trend will continue to accelerate as both millennials and Gen Z enter the workforce and accumulate wealth. Now, when we think about what the landscape is looking like in the capital markets, I want to underscore that this is not just something that's relevant for publicly traded companies. So um, what we do see is a, an expansion really into the debt market, and this is happening quite quickly. And I'm going to talk about why this is relevant to real estate and buildings in particular. So um, regardless of whether you're you know, working for a publicly traded company or a privately held company, um, it's important to understand who is in the value chain of that company because increasingly what we're finding is uh, larger companies that are publicly traded uh, are pushing those who supply to the company to be able to provide ESG information to their own investors and stakeholders. So there's starting to be a trickle down effect into private capital. We're also seeing ESG in credit ratings and equity research. So all of the major credit rating agencies, S&P, DBRS, Morningstar, and Moody's have all started integrating ESG into their core ratings methodologies, assessing the credit worthiness of companies. And indeed, I'm sure many of you have heard about it, but several specialized ESG ratings platforms have also emerged to fill an information gap in the market. But we've also seen a big focus from all of the major banks in North America, making big net zero commitments and placing premiums on positive ESG performance they're starting to create new pools of capital um, called sustainable finance vehicles. And this includes things, but is not limited to green bonds. And it's really focused on achieving ESG targets in their lending portfolios. So you can again, start to see the trickle down effect uh, to private markets as well as public. ESG integration in investment, as I said, institutional investors are going to continue to improve uh, on their sophistication of their analysis and integration. And ultimately, this is going to push heavily for companies to provide more consistent and comparable disclosure, which leads me to the last piece here. There are new, disclosed proposed, or new mandatory disclosure rules proposed for mandatory climate change reporting, both from the Canadian Securities Administrators and the US Securities Exchange Commission. These two rules will have significant implications for access to and cost of capital for those in public markets. And as I mentioned earlier, for those who sit in supply chains of public companies, it's going to increasingly be important that you're able to measure and report on your ESG performance in order to win tenders and fulfill ongoing reporting obligations of these larger entities, particularly given the current proposals are considering the requirement to disclose scope three emissions, which is the upstream and downstream emissions associated with an organization's value chain. So once these rules get finalized, we're going to have a better sense of the scope and coverage, but ultimately a very important trend to monitor. And what we've got here is a quote from BlackRock. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because I think there's a whole lot of conversation and certainly south of the border on the anti-ESG movement suggesting that uh, woke capitalism and integrating values into the investment process uh, is not aligned with fiduciary duty. And so I've pulled out this quote from Larry Fink, who is the CEO of the world's largest asset manager, BlackRock. Uh, every year he issues a public letter to the CEOs of all of the portfolio companies in which BlackRock invests. 
and I've included a couple of excerpts from uh, his letter this year. And BlackRock is really in the spotlight right now when it comes to the anti-ESG movement in the United States. In fact, they're in quite a public battle with uh, the state of Louisiana Pension Fund, uh, which has just withdrawn about $800 million in investments over the notion that they're woke capitalists. Now, reverting back to Larry's letter, which was actually published before this conversation even started later in 2022, um, you can see this right clearly. We focus on sustainability not because we're environmentalists, but because we are capitalists and fiduciaries to our clients. And this requires an understanding of how companies are adjusting their businesses for the massive changes that the economy is undergoing. And he specifically calls out something that I think is highly relevant to the real estate and building sector, which is that few things will impact capital allocation decisions and thereby the long-term value of your company more than how you effectively navigate the global energy transition in the years to ahead. And the reason, of course, this is highly relevant to real estate and buildings is that energy consumption is a huge component of what we see as the material ESG factors for the sector. And so this leads us into the conversation about climate change and net zero. So it's important to note and underscore that when we talk about ESG, it's much broader than just climate change and net zero. But the reason we're seeing the capital markets, both companies and investors alike, focusing on this topic is because it poses systemic financial risks to the global economy. And ultimately, we know that our ability to manage the long-term risks associated with climate change is going to be driven by how quickly we can start to reduce global emissions. Now, the Paris Agreement has set out a goal of limiting emissions to 1.5 degrees, and to do that, we need to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 or earlier. This translates into roughly half in global emissions by 2030 when we look to the more near term. And so on the right, you can see that the capital markets are really doubling down, both on the push for enhanced transparency and disclosure on these topics, but also actual target setting and engagement with companies to drive real world economic outcomes. And the whole reason they're doing this, again, is because they believe there are systemic financial risks that they simply can't diversify away from. And so as a result, really trying to shine a light and allow the markets to price in these risks to ensure that we're actually measuring and managing what matters. And increasingly, you're seeing asset managers and asset owners collaborating and working together to try and harness the power of their voice to influence some of the biggest greenhouse gas emitters globally. Now, I mentioned earlier that there are new pools of capital becoming available in the sustainable finance world. And I've put up a few examples of what the North American banks have committed to in terms of the dollars that they're setting aside to provide sustainable debt financing. Um, the largest of note here is Goldman Sachs with a target of $750 billion. So these are not insignificant investments. In fact, these are all um, big strategic priorities of the banks as they see this as a huge growth opportunity to finance the transition to a low carbon climate resilient economy. And when we think about what sustainable finance instruments are, they typically include things like green bonds, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, and even transition bonds, which focus on providing capital to higher emitting sectors who've traditionally been locked out of accessing green capital because they don't qualify. Now, these bonds are used for project level finance, and usually it's where an organization has actually identified a particular initiative that they want to undertake and need financing. But what we're really starting to see grow in the capital markets lately is this focus on sustainability linked loans and sustainability linked bonds. This is an expansion beyond just the climate change conversation and a linking of environmental and social targets to an interest rate that one pays on a credit facility or a bond with a potential financial upside for the borrower if they outperform on their environmental and social targets. So this is not only about risk mitigation, but also about capitalizing on the opportunity for cheaper debt. So when we look specifically at some of the ESG trends in the global real estate sector, what we've just seen on a macro level certainly applies to real estate. And what we've seen in the last couple of years is actually an accelerating and heightened attention to ESG in the real estate sector, particularly those who provide capital to the sector. Uh, what we found here in this CBRE study uh, from October 2021 was that 60% of real estate owners and investors have integrated ESG into their decision making. And again, we see climate change and the net zero transition being key topics, uh, both globally and in North America. 
And what I've put here is just a snapshot of some of the large names of real estate owners and investors, their location and headquarters, and their aspirations to achieve net zero. And what you can see is certainly in Canada, we've got Brookfield Properties here uh, on the slide, but there are a number here from this list uh, that are also from the US. So again, this is not just something happening in Europe, but certainly closer to home. Now we know that uh, the real estate and building sector has been um, well ahead when it comes to creating certifications around topics like energy efficiency to provide some credibility to home builders um, on their you know, credentials that they're claiming. Now, as we see more and more capital moving into this area, there's gonna be a requirement for organizations to report on their performance over time to their investors. And what we see is things like the Energy Star certification, you know, these types of certifications, I believe, will become increasingly important for the real estate and building sector, given the focus uh, on ESG issues by providers of capital and stakeholders, right? Tenants, landlords, local communities. I think if you think back to our very early diagram, that CSR and uh, capital markets piece are very quickly converging for this sector. And I think also there's a huge opportunity to use certifications to enhance the credibility um, as part of the criteria when issuing perhaps a sustainability linked loan. So it may actually be used to access some of these new pools of capital and something that could be directly written into loan agreements. And last but certainly not least, um, you know, certifications, education for the sector and collaboration between the sector really does need to be fit for purpose and address a market need, right? So whether it's linking um, with access to and cost of capital related to insurance or even the ability to attract and retain talent, these are all key value propositions for an investment uh, to be made into this space. And now I'm gonna get into some of the reporting frameworks that can be used to measure and report on these items. I'm just gonna pause and see, Adam, do we have any questions from the audience yet? And if not, I would encourage folks to use the uh, Q&A and chat function just to submit your questions. I'll leave a little bit of time at the end as well. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. We, ha we have a couple little ones, but I think um, it might be best if you keep going for now. Okay, great. I'll trust your judgment on that, Adam. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to get into now, um, these are kind of the macro trends that are obviously driving uh, the push, and I hope, if, if not convinced, uh, you are now convinced that this issue is certainly not going anywhere. So now I think we need to get into what does the current state of reporting for real estate uh, and buildings look like, and then more broadly, what are investors pushing for when it comes to standards? So what I've called out here is the GRESP framework. Uh, GRESP stands for Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark. I'm sure many of you on the webinar are familiar with this if you're working in the sector, but for those who are not, this is a mission-driven investor-led organization that's really focused on trying to provide actionable and transparent ESG data to the financial markets. So it is very much so a sector focused on real estate. They collect, validate, score, and benchmark ESG data and for their customers or for those who actually um, provide or are seeking this information, it gives them business intelligence and engagement tools, as well as regulatory reporting solutions for investors, asset managers, and even the wider industry. And so we see that this is the most commonly used by real estate and buildings companies to report on real asset ESG performance to their financial stakeholders. And there are two other key frameworks that have emerged, uh, and these are more broad beyond just the real estate sector. And these are the ones that have emerged as the investor preference for communicating on and reporting on uh, the impact of material ESG issues on the value of a company. And that is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board or the SASB Standards and the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure or the TCFD recommendations. So I'm gonna walk you through both of them briefly, uh, but the reason that investors favor these is because they focus on the most financially material ESG risks and opportunities. So again, thinking about the impact of environmental and social issues on the operational and financial performance of the company. And so we see the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board taking an industry specific approach. So you'll recall when I said, I was showing you kind of this, the second slide with the ESG diagram, um, you know, the sector is usually the starting point to figuring out what might be the potentially material issues for my organization. 
And SASB figured this out pretty quickly. They started up in 2011, based in the United States. And the whole idea around these is to come up with a set of ESG disclosure topics and associated accounting metrics that companies could use to disclose financially relevant decision useful ESG information to their investors in a cost effective way. And we've seen skyrocketing growth uh, in the adoption voluntarily of SASB standards by companies in response to pressure from their investors. In Canada, our Maple Leaf pensions, the largest pensions who definitely punch above their weight on a global scale, um, publicly requested companies they invest in to use the SASB standards for their ESU reporting on material issues. And we've also seen on a global scale that the International Financial Reporting Standards, or the IFRS Foundation, which sets global financial reporting standards, including in Canada, they've established uh, the International Sustainability Standards Board, and they actually absorbed SASB. So SASB will now form the backbone of these new international global standards. And this is important uh, for organizations to pay attention to. The second framework is specifically focused on climate. So where SASB is broadly ESG, this one is specifically focused in on climate change. And the two of them go together. I'm going to show you in the next slide. So the TCFD is really focused on climate disclosure and covers four pillars, governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. And why is the TCFD important? Well, it was created to address some of those unpriced financial risks in the capital markets. It was actually developed by the Financial Stability Board in 2015 and has largely become the backbone of the new regulations that are being proposed by the CSA and the SEC in North America. So it's an important tool to pay attention to. And as I mentioned, the two fit together. So in the circle here, you can see the four categories of the TCFD. And ultimately, the SASB standards provide some of the quantitative metrics that shed important light on the effectiveness of the company's governance strategy and risk management processes. And the SASB metrics can be used to inform the setting and reporting of metrics and targets by organizations. Now, I mentioned that the International Sustainability Standards Board has been struck and it has consolidated in the SASB standards. This is a really important initiative to pay attention to for a couple of reasons. The first is that these are going to be global accounting standards that will ultimately be adopted here in Canada by public companies. They will go through a process of making sure they're fit for purpose for our own unique circumstances here in Canada. And that's ultimately going to be administered by the Canadian Sustainability Standards Board, which is set to be operational in the spring of 2023. On a global scale, we've seen the publishing of two draft uh, disclosure standards, the first being general requirements for disclosure of sustainability related financial information, which builds on SASB. And the second is specifically on climate disclosures, and that builds on the TCFD. So for those of you who may be responsible for reporting for your organization, these are two critically important frameworks to get familiar with, and certainly the ISSB initiative and the work being done here in Canada with the CSSB are also important things to monitor. Now, when we look at the difference between what the regulators have proposed on the topic of climate change here in Canada versus the US, we see the US's proposal being far more detailed and technical, requiring a significant amount more disclosure than the Canadian proposal. Both of these are out for consultation, and I can certainly provide a link to a much more detailed comparison that our firm pulled together uh, if it's of interest to anyone. But what I really want to underscore here is that the drive for transparency is not going anywhere. Both of these use the TCFD framework as the backbone. Both rules are expected to be finalized by the end of this year and come into effect for the reporting year ended December 31st, 2023. So regardless of what the final rules look like, we can start to see that organizations will be required over time to report their scope one, two, and eventually their scope three emissions in regulatory reports, subjecting them to a much higher level of scrutiny and eventually a potential for third party audit. We also see a huge focus on the management of climate change, including the identification, assessment, and mitigation of climate-related risks and opportunities, and a huge focus on board oversight of climate change and the integration into oversight of strategy and risk. These last couple of slides really just get into what would it look like from a best practices standpoint for those of you who may be serving on management teams or boards of directors of those in the real estate and building sector.
the key takeaway here is that it's ultimately management's responsibility to do the heavy lifting, to assess the materiality of climate-related risks and opportunities, to evaluate what are the appropriate levels of ambition with respect to metrics and targets, and ultimately to present this information to the board for reviews and ultimately approvals. And it's really the board's job to make sure they understand the processes management has gone through to achieve this, asking good questions to ensure all key factors have been considered and testing results to make sure that they're comfortable. Ultimately, we also see a lot of boards seeking education on the issue of climate change annually to keep up their skills and competencies to ensure effective oversight. And as time goes on, we'll see board oversight and approvals of climate-related financial reporting. Now, the last couple of pieces here, one thing to keep in mind when we think about governance structures, there is no one size fits all. Now, best practice is for the full board to have accountability over overseeing uh, ESG risks and their impacts on business strategy and long-term value. But we also see that relevant committees can be engaged to assist the board in fulfilling those duties. Things like the audit committee being involved in the review and approval of financial reporting related to climate change, or the HR and corporate governance committee considering climate related skills in their onboarding of new directors or recruiting for new members. And on this note, I think it's really important that we continue the conversation around board ESG education and skills. So the first thing, which is a low hanging fruit, is that ensuring that the board skills matrix, if one exists, actually includes relevant ESG related experience and skill sets. On an annual basis, we're seeing more and more companies considering ESG related skills and capabilities in their annual board performance reviews. And certainly when they're recruiting new members, a lot of boards of directors are looking to get some of these ESG capabilities around the boardroom table. Board orientation and continuing education should also include ESG topics. And certainly where we see committees or even dedicated committees responsible for climate change and ESG, they will typically receive more frequent education just given how quickly the space is moving. And so my last slide for you here is just on key takeaways and then happy to open it up and answer any clarifying questions or comments. The first is that the real estate and building sector has come up the curve quite quickly in the last couple of years, relative to some other sectors who've been facing the pressure on ESG for quite some time. I'm thinking of, for example, oil and gas companies. And I think it's important to note that you're gonna to continue to face pressure from many stakeholders. Yes, providers of capital like debt and equity, but also others in the space, other stakeholders. Oops, I just lost my slides there. Uh, and what we really want to ensure is that you're also paying attention to the work that's being done by regulators and governments. Now we see energy efficiency as a key tool in the net zero transition and the largest issue facing the real estate and building sector. And I would also note that as climate change impacts increase, we also see obviously amendments to national building codes and building climate resilience in the face of extreme weather events being another key area when we think of climate change and ESG for the sector. And last but certainly not least, certifications are gonna be important to illustrate credibility as you move forward into the implementation phase of these ESG strategies where the real rubber hits the road. So that's all for my presentation uh, this morning. You've got my contact information here on the slide. I will stop sharing my screen and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was that was really that was a really good overview. Um, and uh, so the reason I didn't uh, ask any questions, I was trying to organize them into sort of uh, similar chunks so that maybe it would be easier to answer them. Um, but uh, just a reminder for anyone else who has any questions, if you, if you some, some people might not remember where to get to it. So if you look in your screen, there should be a, the, a little um, red arrow pointing in toward the middle of your screen. If you click on that, there's a little question pane that opens up. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question directly to Sarah, click on the little hand, it will pop up and then I can unmute your mic for you to ask the question directly. Um, so with that, uh, a few questions. So. Start, I'm, I'm starting with sort of building owner, property managers, um, that sort of vein. Um, how can property managers ensure that they're meeting ESG demands um, when seeking investment? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so look, property managers in many cases are on the front lines of the actions needed to really fulfill the ESG strategies, right, on the ground. Um, and I think one of the most important things is to familiarize yourself with the information you're going to be asked for eventually if you haven't already. And so one of the best places to look would be take a look at the sector-specific standard from SASB. Uh, to see what are some of those baseline sets of ESG disclosure topics and metrics that investors are likely to ask about. And then the second area is uh, taking a look into that GRESP framework. They have a significant amount of metrics. Uh, so if there is uh, you know, familiarity with that or if not, uh, it's definitely worth taking a look at that just to get a better sense of how your investors uh, and providers of capital may eventually come knocking for, for information and what exactly they may be looking for. Okay, thanks. Um, so these two questions are sort of um, combined. Uh, it's actually more than two, but I'm trying to combine them even further. Um, can you describe like how big of a change might this be for some companies? And I'm particularly thinking uh, barriers for smaller companies. Um, is this going to require them to bring on new staff? Are they going to need to reorganize the company? Um, is it just tasks that will be given to people who are already doing things? Um, what will that kind of look like? Really great question and a common one, right? I think, you know, Canada is a country of small, medium-sized enterprises. And a lot of the time what we see is the leaders in ESG being the largest organizations, right? The names that I was mentioning in my presentation are all the big names, whether investors uh, or property owners or developers. So what I think is really important here is to recognize, number one, there's probably some really good lessons learned from some of the bigger players that can be applied to your organization. So that can help you by reviewing some of those bigger reports, just to get a sense on what are the key issues that are already facing the sector that we see some of the leaders communicating on to give you a bit of a leg up and understand where things might be headed for you. The second piece though, I think is a really important one, which is who owns it in a smaller enterprise. Um, our firm does a lot of work with smaller and medium sized organizations and the resource limitations are very real challenge in this regard. So first and foremost, what we see is um, cross-functional committees being developed to help spread the workload and ensure connectivity of ESG strategies. So within your organization, you might want to involve finance, um, legal, as well as maybe HR and even operations, right? So getting some of that cross-functional perspective um, can help lighten the load and ensure that everyone is on the same page before even investing any time and resources. And the third piece of advice that I would give you is really about conducting a materiality assessment. I think doing a robust materiality assessment on your ESG risks and opportunities gives you permission to focus those scarce resources. Um, it allows you to be able to explain to stakeholders why you're focusing your efforts in one area or topic over another, and ultimately um, driving your resources toward the greatest bang for buck uh, in terms of you know, hitting on those priority areas that do have the greatest potential to impact your organization's performance and matter most to your investors and other stakeholders. Okay, one came in that is sort of following on that. I, that, I think that was, a, that was a great answer. And then this sort of is an addendum. Is it mainly accounting firms providing support uh, for ESGs? Uh, and if not, is that accounting done internally? Yeah, it's a great question. Like even the TCFD framework, when it was first released um, back in 2017, the idea was that um, the finance function would own it. And I'm an accountant myself and spent four years working at CPA Canada. And what we've really found is that the finance function alone just simply does not have the capacity or expertise to be able to do this solo. Uh, so we see a lot of organizations choosing to put the ownership in all sorts of different places. So yes, the finance function where the reporting is a big driver, so typically a big public company, um, but we're also seeing it in investor relations if you are a public company and kind of on that front line of communicating with your investors. But we've also seen it owned all the way up uh, at the top of the house for smaller companies where the CEO sees this as a strategic priority and an, op an opportunity for uh, growth. Um, I will say that no matter what, everyone kind of needs to become ESG literate. I mean, the goal of ESG is that sustainability and business become one and the same, right? And I think where we're trying to get to is really empowering people to understand in their individual roles and responsibilities 
what is their part in the execution of the ESG strategy for the organization? So I think being really clear about roles and responsibilities is important, but similar to at the board level, there's just no one size fits all. And I often say to folks, kind of take an inventory of what existing working groups you might have or internal committees and see if it might make sense to add ESG to those agendas as well. Okay, so speaking of partnerships, um, another question just came in, uh, where do you see engineering consulting firms take part and have you, have you seen them as in partnerships? Yeah, so I mean, you know, we've been asked, you know, are the big accounting firms doing this? I think the short answer is yes. Um, I would say the lay of the land is kind of, even for our firm, when we do an analysis, for example, of who's advising companies and investors on this, um, we see the bigger players like the big accounting firms, as well as uh, even the law firms and some of the bigger management consultancies like McKinsey and BCG all jumping into the ESG space. And that makes a lot of sense. Uh, they typically work with Fortune 500 clients and much bigger, more integrated mandates. But for your average uh, small medium enterprise, they typically can't afford, you know, the price tag associated with some of those larger engagements. It's not quite fit for purpose. Where we see them playing is closer to uh, working with boutique ESG advisors like ourselves and many others across the country. Um, so kind of that more targeted, um, bespoke style solutions that really meet clients where they are and are suited to their size and budget. Um, but the third area we're starting to see is um, really around the engineering firms. And I think there's a natural extension to the technical capabilities and bench strength that they have. So for example, WSP would be a great example of a leading uh, engineering firm that has not only uh, set out a really clear strategic plan and put ESG as one of its top priorities in terms of growth and services for its clients, but also is doing the difficult work of walking the talk and actually setting its own net zero ambition and science-based targets. So um, I would love to point to WSP as a really good example of an engineering firm that's doubling down in this area. Great example. Um, yeah, especially that they're doing it for themselves and then that means also they're doing it for their clients as part of the process. Um, exactly. Okay, so shifting a little bit um, to municipal um, governments. This, we have a lot of interest there, obviously. Um, we've seen some, some action, um, particularly, particularly south of the border um, with municipal bond markets and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So do you have any advice on how municipal governments can harness um, ESG to ensure that uh, sort of better development outcomes? Yeah, it's a really important question. And, you know, I think if we look at just the issue of um, climate change and net zero alone, we know that 80% of the world's emissions are found in cities. So under the kind of jurisdiction of municipalities, right? And this is where a lot of the um, practical elements play out. And so, a couple of quick things. What we see is a lot of initiatives here in Canada with respect to um, municipalities working together to partner for things like climate resilience uh, and setting of targets. So we see um, lots of collaboration between cities. Um, you've got the C20 climate, C40 climate cities initiative, for example, which uh, City of Toronto is involved in. And some of the bigger municipalities um, have the budgets, have the resources. And similar to what we were saying with respect to companies, I think smaller municipalities can start to look to um, some of the leadership and things that larger cities are doing um, to experiment with their own ESG reporting and information uh, and start to learn some of those lessons and, and hopefully, you know, prioritize those resources given the least smaller municipalities. So, uh, I always like to point folks to the City of Toronto's ESG report. Um, it was led by their CFO. Um, and what I think is interesting about this, it used the SASB standards. Um, again, these are things that are used, um, coming from capital markets, used, used by private sector that are now being applied to public sector. Uh, and the second area I would point you to, uh, just leading on uh, kind of the things I've left you with from the presentation is, um, Cities are also starting to use TCFD as a reporting framework for their own climate risk and opportunity. And so uh, CPA Canada has published a couple of case studies on City of Vancouver, City of Montreal, and City of Toronto in how they've adapted the TCFD framework in a public context. 
Now, for those who are kind of trying to work with municipalities in the sector, I think this provides you with a lot of intel on the direction of travel and the specific information and priorities and metrics that are being used by municipalities to really establish their ESG plans. Okay. Um, all right, I see we're, we're close to time. Uh, we're gonna try to end with this question, um, which is, um, it, it was, it was uh, specifically about municipalities, but I think it applies to everyone. Um, how, what tools are there to properly evaluate an ESG disclosure? Yeah, it's a really, really good question and a hard one. Um, so look, I think right now, um, everything has been voluntary for the most part. And what we're starting to see with the emergence of the new global standards and even the more local regulations is we're kind of coalescing around a few key frameworks, the ones that I've outlined in the presentation here today. Um, so what I would say is try to take a look at, a, you know, in the municipality context, I already gave you a uh, city of Toronto, but try to take a look at some of the public plans um, that have been put out. You'll actually see um, climate adaptation strategies in particular being a, a lot of uh, detail provided by municipalities uh, in this area. And you can start to see, I think, very clearly what's going to be the priority focus um, in terms of the real estate and building sector and building climate resilience. Um, you know, the other thing is that you've got the Federation of Canadian Municipalities doing a Partners for Climate Protection program. They have a lot of tools and resources as well. Um, and I highly encourage you to get um, familiar with the GRESP framework. And there are a number of free trainings available on SASB and TCFD uh, on their websites and a ton of implementation tools on the reporting side of things. Uh, and in particular, if you're looking for snapshots of what's good, um, I was just reading the 2022 TCFD status report. So on the issue of climate specifically, they've got some really good case studies. It gives you a snapshot globally and by region uh, what good disclosure looks like. And just keep in mind that really uh, it's about progress, not perfection. Everyone is learning and on a learning curve here. And so taking a look at best practice, benchmarking relative to peers, and taking a look at some of these overall uh, reports and findings can be a really useful starting point. And accessing the tools that come along with them, I think, is another key uh, opportunity for folks. Okay. Um, thank you. This, uh, it's, um, it is, as you say, rapidly changing and growing. Um, it's a difficult, um, a difficult sphere, I think, um, to add in maybe a lot of extra complexity um, to something that's already quite complex. Um, do you have, a, I'm gonna just uh, show my screen here to just thank everyone for attending. Um, while we have maybe, do you have any comment on the potential for this um, to be used sort of as a greenwashing through uh, complexity. Any idea, yeah. any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's exactly what all these new rules and regulations are trying to combat. It has definitely become a wild west. Uh, toward the end of 2021, we saw a lot of folks claiming net zero aspirations. Uh, and now, you know, facing the real pressure of saying, what's the plan? Uh, and how are you going to get there? And I think uh, those who moved forward without a plan are now scrambling to figure that out. Uh, and I think as we continue to see, you know, the regulators, whether it's central banks, financial regulators, credit rating agencies, um, the uh, level of attention and scrutiny on this issue is going to continue to focus in on getting that transparency for consistent and comparable information to avoid that issue of greenwashing over time. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, with that, I, I'd like to um, thank you again, Sarah. This was a really, really um, great presentation, uh, really eye-opening um, on the complexity of it, um, but also that, yeah, it does, it, there's, there's a lot of tools that are helping sort of lead the way there. Um, so thank you for your time, um, and thank you to all of our attendees today. Um, I, one other note, um, the, our, uh, Great friend of Sustainable Buildings Canada, uh, Rebecca Black, who's always helped with the Green Building Festival, is also working on ESG as part of uh, strategic planning with SBC. Um, and so here's some information if you'd like to follow up on that and learn a, a little bit more through that. And as always, you can reach out to um, Sarah. We will send out uh, the presentation, the recording of this, and contact information so um, you can get in touch with Sarah uh, to, to get led along um, this ESG path. Thank you again, Sarah. Everyone have a wonderful day.
Thanks, Adam. Thanks to all of you. My pleasure. Yeah.